animators, and artists. To celebrate Toon Boom Animation's 30th anniversary, we're hosting virtual studio tours with studios that make exceptional use of Harmony and Starboard Pro. Joining us for our first episode in the series are Nadine Westerbarkey, Carl Upstell, and Chelsea Kerr from mm -hmm. Atomic Cartoons. So um, Atomic Cartoons is an animation studio with locations in Vancouver, Ottawa, and LA, and is known for their work from writing and producing to animating on a wide variety of series. It's the studio started in Canada and has contributed to truly world-class productions. So Nadine, Carl, Chelsea, welcome to the live stream. Thank you so, so much. And happy anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So um, let's go through, uh, starting with Nadine, what is your role at Atomic Cartoons and what does a typical day in your role look like? Absolutely. Yeah, my role at Atomic is Studio Creative Director, which is a role that does not say much about what a person really does. I would say the majority of my focus is on supporting our directors and art directors. I'm very involved at the early stages on projects, just finding that creative language and then translating that and then also carrying that forward and supporting throughout the projects just from the creative uh, side as much as possible. Um, my day can be anything and everything. Um, a lot of it is meetings, but I usually start my day quite early. So I try to do either art or any kind of mood boards or something like that early in the morning. Um, then going into meetings, having a lot of like one-on-one -on -one conversations just to help guide uh, things. And then in the evenings, I spend a lot of my time reviewing what our teams are doing um, because that's actually, yeah, always a lot of fun. It's always very inspiring to see the work. And um, Chelsea, what does your what is your role at Atomic Cartoons and what does a typical day in your role look like? I'm the uh, supervising director at Atomic Cartoons, working alongside Carl and Nadine mentioned one-on-ones. I've had many one-on-ones with Nadine. <laughs> um, my days are, are meetings. It's back-to-back -back meetings, basically. I even just came from a audio record right before this. So, But it can vary, which is exciting. So it can just be like I'm reviewing, I'm in an edit session, I'm in an audio record, looking at the latest animation. It's, yeah, every day I have to look at my calendar ahead, like, what am I doing today? Okay. <laughs> so it keeps changing. And Carl, I've heard Nadine describe you as Atomic's Harmony Wizard. Uh, what does a typical day look like in your role and how do you describe it? Uh, well, thanks for that. Uh, uh, yeah, I've worked in Harmony for, you know, uh, decades now, really. Um, back before it was even Harmony. Uh, uh, I'm in, currently in a technical directing role. Uh, so you know, a variety of tasks, most of them uh, on a technical level. Uh, I'm making sure that, you know, as designs come through, uh, it's achievable by the team. Uh, and so making any notes there for change of design uh, and moving into builds, making sure that everything that was sort of in that design is able to be achieved by the builds team. And then all of those things that the characters need to do is uh, available for the animation team. Uh, also looking at uh, scene setup and asset tagging and just making sure that the scenes themselves are set up in a way that can achieve what we need. Um, but on a, a creative level, I'm also uh, helping to find those final look targets. Uh, a lot of times there's like an extra step beyond what's in the initial design for like lighting, final staging, camera moves, and all of those other filmmaking techniques that we use. And so helping in a bit more of a, like a shot level, just within shots, helping to make sure that we can kind of get that final look that we're all going for. And Nadine, how would you describe Atomic Cartoons and the type of animation that your studio specializes in? I would say from a studio side, just um, culturally, it's a very collaborative place. So it's a, it's a studio that really, really fosters any mentorship, collaboration. Um, the type of work that we do is actually incredibly diverse. So we do 2D and 3D animation. We work in different format, um, like we do um, feature length format. We do series um, format. We do short format at times as well. And then anything that goes from preschool to adult. So we really always try to work on a very diverse 
um, amount of projects because it really also gets a lot of our artists very excited because depending on what they're excited about, um, that has quite a range and, and we really try to yeah work on a lot of exciting things. Um, push is always towards a very high quality bar, but always together, like we really do want to figure things out within a team. Yeah, I've heard of uh, Atomic being described as an artist-driven studio. Um, what does that mean? It really does mean, first of all, that this studio was um, founded by uh, a group of creatives and then everything that the studio does and that goes from the leadership side to um, production is always fostering um, the creative as best as possible and this is something that we also do in a way that's a little unique to me like i worked in so many different studios and when i came to atomic what stood out to me was how production and creative and technical are actually very very closely connected and it is really us also um truly listening to where everybody's needs are or if somebody has different interests um we have a lot of people who start in one department and then want to maybe explore something else and we always try and provide mentorship opportunities so a person can do that switch and it is something that really is more inspiring like a lot of places are a little bit more restricted potentially and and that's something that i think we are trying to break that mold as best as that's possible within again timelines and everything that we we have and Chelsea, how would you describe Atomic Cartoons and the type of animation that the studio specializes in? Oh my gosh, I think Nadine said such a good job and all the <laughs> what we've done. I was trying to think of beyond the TV shows and, and everything else. I feel like Carl, we didn't we do like a Marvel thing that was like a part of a theme theme park? I don't know. Maybe you can speak more to that. That was a unique project. Yeah, we've had some interesting one-offs. Uh, yeah, that was definitely uh, outside of the norm. Uh, we've also done a theme park uh, ride for Curious George for mm -hmm. Universal Studios Japan, where um, there's a, a live action set that's been set up and there's a piece of glass that sits in front of the set that the audience can't see. And then they project Curious George as a 2D animation over top of it. And he's sort of jumping in and out of different garbage cans or ceiling fans and all these different props on the set uh, but everything had to be timed out exactly and placed just so so that like as the audience looking at it at a certain angle can't tell like that it's something that's sitting above uh, so we've had weird projects like that that are sort of fun to kind of jump into they they're there for just a very short amount of time require a lot of technical uh, details and then that's it. We never, we never see a project like that again. And um, okay, so in that, in that case, uh, Carl, uh, how do you describe your journey to your current role at Atomic Cartoons? Um, the the road to where I am now uh, has taken some twists and turns, um, but you can kind of see how like each each role that I've had is sort of a building block to the next. Um, so coming out of school, uh, I kind of jumped in in two feet and I was uh, an assistant animator. And so I was doing some hand drawn and like quite a bit of line mileage there, which was, uh, you know, really good to start. I kind of got used to uh, working at a very fast pace in TV animation. Uh, but from there, I, you know, I did some digital compositing uh, and then uh, digital ink and paint. So like just paint by numbers, some click work, uh, but then uh, moved into animating uh, and then eventually supervising and, and directing. So, uh, you know, being in each one of those roles was sort of necessary to sort of have a better understanding of what's required for the next role. Uh, and then also paying some of that back of being an animator realizing these are some of the things that could be helpful for me and then being in a supervisor role and maybe being able to offer some of those things uh, to the animation team. So uh, I've been uh, pretty fortunate in my career to be within you know, the studio uh, and being supported myself as well, being mentored along the way. Uh, and Nadine is, is one of those people who's been a, an amazing mentor to me. Okay, I think it's really interesting that you sort of mention uh, to 
um, uh, shift between paper and digital workflows. Uh, and we're definitely going to get back to that. Um, Nadine, how do you describe your journey to your current role at Atomic Cartoons? It's, uh, it's an interesting one, for sure. Kind of similar to Carl's, but I would say just location-based, quite different. Um, I started in the 90s in Germany. I was very passionate about animation. At that point in time, education within Europe was a bit trickier for animation. So I started as an intern on a feature film and was just absolutely curious and, and maybe annoying with a lot of people just going to teach me. I want to learn this and I want to try this and um, was lucky to basically start in in-betweens then going into cleanup. I went into layouts. I went into animation after that. That was where I wanted to be and then was very, very fortunate to get an opportunity to work in Australia um, with the Disney studio there for a few years. Also just um, as an animator, as a supervisor, I transitioned there into supervising and more leadership um, type roles. And then always wanted to come to Canada. It was a passion of mine to move and got a chance to move to Toronto first, working with Yauza there. And then um, I would say the best part of my career was actually finding Atomic and, or Atomic finding me. <laughs> I'm not quite sure who found whom <laughs> at the time, but it was a studio that didn't just offer projects that excited me because the projects there were definitely something I was very curious about the team and and then that collaboration was amazing and I started as um, animation director at Atomic together with Carl which was amazing and um, and then progressed into the head of 2D and then into my current role where I get a chance to actually expand my knowledge further out towards uh, 3D as well but Traditionally, my skill set is animation, design, and story. That's where I spend the majority of time as an artist. Did you find that working in like different animation markets was a, a really big benefit? Like be yeah. because you got to see very different pipelines. Oh, one hundred percent. I'm very, very thankful for those experiences because it is actually quite different to work in Europe in comparison to working in North America. Just because the size of studios was very different at the time and. Um, over there, I had the chance, and I think, Carl, you mentioned the building blocks um, as well. Like, I really had to jump into different departments. Like, I did comp, I did, I built maquettes at the time for features as well. Um, I sometimes had to do in campaign to, um, just to help out. And all of those experiences, production was um, a side of um, support that we also had to provide from the creative. And all of that actually really helped me to get an understanding of what do other departments do? What do they need? And that right now is so important for my current role because I try to really ask questions around that as well and then learning from that. And uh, it's amazing to see how much the creative influences also tie into what we do every day as well. And Chelsea, how would you describe your journey to your current role at Atomic Cartoons? Yeah, so I graduate. I was also a Vancouverite and graduated from Emily Carr University here in 2010 and then did a little bit of freelance and ended up at Atomic in 2011 uh, with what I call my peeling potatoes job, which was working on a motion, Marvel motion comic with Carl, I believe. I think we've all had this journey with Carl where we started at the same time. Um, and uh, it was my job to take a digital comic book page into Photoshop, use the lasso tool and remove the character from the background and then relabel it. Not very glamorous, not very creative, but it got me in the door and I haven't left since. They can't make me. I've been there since 2011. So uh, I've tried on a bunch of different hats from there. I primarily did a lot of background art but tried a little bit of compositing, a little bit of animation, a little bit of design, and then ended up doing a test for Cupcake and Dino on Netflix for a storyboard position, originally a storyboard revisionist position, but they just gave me the full storyboard artist role, learned on my feet very, very quickly. <laughs> and uh, from there I did storyboard supervising, then storyboard directing, and now I'm the um, supervising director. So all that, uh, those all those steps along the way, there's no way I could do this job now if I hadn't seeing all these different departments and seeing what it needs to function in those. And I'm still learning so, so much. And so I'm like, thank goodness I have Nadine and Carl to poke their brains and <laughs> how do we do this? <laughs> Can we do this? So, yeah. And Carl, how would you describe your current journey to your role at Atomic Cartoons? 
Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think again, that, that sort of those, those natural steps sort of occurred. Um, I worked for a few studios around town, uh, in Vancouver as well. Um, my, my first job was at a uh, Bardell studio and, um, that was for an assisting animation job. So, uh, paper and pencil. Uh, but at that time, around the 2000s, uh, a lot of the paper and pencil jobs were going away. Uh, the industry was starting to transition into a digital workplace. And it took the studios a couple years to sort of figure out what that new workflow looked like and how do you make a show uh, using a cutout digital uh, style. Um, and so in that time, I moved over to Mercury Filmworks and I was doing some digital ink and paint and compositing for them uh, and realizing like I really had a passion for animation and I wanted to be an animator. So in that time, uh, Flash had become a bit more of a prominent program. And so taught myself how to use Flash and applied for some cutout jobs and then worked at Bardell as a an animator in Flash for quite a few years until they also transitioned over into a Harmony pipeline. And then at that point learned Harmony uh, sort of on the job. Uh, and that eventually uh, opened the doors for opportunities at Atomic. And then I've been at Atomic ever since. So uh, Atomic Cartoons first opened its doors in Vancouver in 1999. In your view, how has the animation industry changed since then, both in terms of business and art? And we'll start with Nadine. Oh my gosh, it has changed so, so much and continues to change as well. But I would say um, at that point in time, clearly, Carl, you just mentioned it as well. It's like, yeah, we did the pencil on paper um, work still at that point. And everything that had to do with technology was so new and very, very hard to actually embrace into your personal creative processes just because it was not accessible. It was maybe not affordable as well. Definitely, I struggle with that side quite heavily. Um, but then right now, if you compare it where you can find even apps right now that you can use for animation, again, the software is so accessible, like people can have um, Toon Boom at home, you can integrate texture, you can integrate 3D. There's really no limitation to what you would like to tell on screen anymore. Um, so many different ways to also highlight your stories. Like you can um, bring your content to like YouTube. You can just really find your audience a lot more directly as well. Stories have changed, or maybe the stories haven't changed, but there's more stories out there. Um, there is storytellers who currently have their shows available, who you wouldn't have seen many, many years ago. And I think just that focus on true storytelling, authentic storytelling, that has been such a priority over the past years, which is amazing, super inspiring. And also just both the creative and story side to me is incredible. Studios adapted, in my opinion, a lot more towards also being more diverse in just their teams and also creating safe spaces. So that awareness is very, very close to my heart and something that I find amazing. So it's great to see how the whole industry is shifting and transforming constantly. Yeah, I think there's so much uh, unmet demand too for stories, um, especially like there, there, there just have been unserved uh, things for uh, teens and for uh, girls, um, and I, I, I think it's really exciting to see that there's been uh, very recently a big change in the amount of projects that get greenlit. Um, things have changed a lot in the past year, um, but uh, I'm overall hopeful. Uh, Chelsea, um, from your view, how has animation changed since uh, Atomic first opened its doors, uh, both in terms of the business and art in the industry? Yeah, so in 1999, I was 11, so I don't I don't know, I wasn't there. I was watching uh, Muppets in Space, or I was trying to look up 1999 movies. It wasn't a great year for movies, I gotta say, except Muppets in Space. Um, but uh, I joined, what I can only speak for my the industry when I joined it, so that was 2011. And even in that period of time, I have noticed the stories and the voices that are being told, and it's just gotten so much better over time. And I think part of it is to do with, you know, 
the, yeah, like more accessibility, like you were saying, Nadine, but also like probably streaming and that kind of thing, more platforms that are looking for animation and different stories. And even, you know, this, this very thing that we're doing this live uh, presentation, I think within 2020, it's been so accessible to have working from home and having people from all over the world be able to work with you and not having to be the physically in a studio anymore, which is pretty liberating and exciting. What what will just keep increasing from there? It's, it's cool. <laughs> and Carl, in your view, how has the animation industry changed since 1999, both in terms of business and art? Uh, yeah, we've seen quite a bit of uh, change, both in the industry and within the studio. Um, there was, uh, yeah, like there, like everyone's saying, there was sort of a, a higher cost of entry previously. And with all of the access to information, um, social media allowing you to self-publish, um, that sort of opened the door for new creators. And uh, you don't really need an approval from a studio anymore. You can just pick up a, a digital pen or paper and, uh, and you can make something and share it with the world. So that's pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, so if I remember correctly, uh, Tomic uh, worked on a project called The Oddballs, which was adapted from a YouTube series that one's out. A hundred percent. It was very exciting to actually translate the YouTube series with, again, James onto um, the episodic format, both Chelsea and Carl are very involved in this one. Mm -hmm. And um, and it is amazing also working with creatives who then have that opportunity to change the stories and, and adapt that forward into the episodic workflow. And, and James was just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is so cool. I get to work with a team and, and I get to also learn how that is different from my independent work as an artist and maybe like, collaborations and very, very small teams towards, I'm now working with a large group of people in a very, very different um, pipeline and just overall approach. And it's something that I think all of us were very inspired by both ways because you learn from each other so much in that process. Yeah, I also think too that if someone's asking a creator like, hey, is there an audience for this idea? Being able to say, hey, well, these videos get a million views each. Um, I think that's a good proof of concept. Oh, a hundred percent. And that always blows me away. It's amazing what James is doing with his YouTube uh, series as well. And again, I, I cannot tell you how many people were so excited to just even hear that we would work on this because it was so familiar to so many. And um, yeah, we feel very lucky that we have chances to work on projects like this. We've got a question in the chat that I'd just like to uh, to, to raise. Um, so we have a question that says, uh, for developing your career, is it more beneficial to get experience from multiple studios or to focus on one specific studio and work your way up? Hmm. Very interesting question. Um, I would say there is no set rule for either. I think learning from different studios, personally, I always loved and enjoyed just because every studio is slightly different for progression. Um, and I can only speak from my journey, again, Chelsea and, and Carl, you probably have a really good perspective on this one. I joined many, many studios um, and that came more from the work that was available and the projects I was interested in. Within that transition, I sometimes went from artist to leadership and then maybe transitioning to a different place, I would go back into an artist role. Um, and then again, maybe progress forward. I like those changes. I actually still really embrace also just jumping into an artist role um, as well. But yeah, it's a hard one to answer what might be the better path. I think both can be very relevant, but Chelsea and Carl, I'm sure you have some thoughts around this one too. Yeah, I know. I, yeah, I'm a, uh, I feel like I'm a unique case for animation that I have been at the studio for a really long time. When I say like, yeah, I've been here for 12 years, people are like, what? Like, it just doesn't really happen because it is so contract based. And I just, it just has happened that it's a contract will come up and then a new show will show up and 
Atomic will offer me it and I'll be like, yeah, okay, that sounds good. And I know, especially with Atomic too, that like I mentioned, I've changed so many different positions, but I had the opportunity to do that as well. If I was just stuck in one lane, maybe I would have jumped ship and tried different studios. But yeah, I don't know that there is one way of, of doing it. That's not, yeah, it worked for me, but I wouldn't, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's the way. Yeah, I find, um, you know, the, the studio itself, uh, when you look at like how many people work here, the numbers can be a little bit intimidating. Uh, you know, looking at Atomic, we're, we're a studio of a thousand plus or minus. And, and so you think to yourself, wow, what, what's it like to work with a thousand people? But actually at the end of the day, it's a very small group of people that you work with very closely. Um, so either you're an animator on a line, and maybe you're working with 10 other animators and a supervisor, and you see Chelsea in a meeting or, or um, the animation director and you know, you're in communication with them, but really on the day to day, you're talking with your supervisor, or your coordinator or the animators around you. And so in that way, it's a bit more of an intimate setting. And um, you know, different shows can have different feel even within the studio. I think the studio itself sort of sets the mood and creates the like tone that we apply to each show. But within the show itself, you know, there's all these different challenges that happen from day to day. And some of those challenges can be pretty unique to that show. Uh, but again, from our kind of a comment we were saying earlier, it's the people that you're working with and it's that cooperation and figuring out like how everyone kind of works together that really does make that show. So, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting how uh, as big as a studio can get, it can actually be quite small when, you, when you're working on it from day to day. So Atomic Cartoons has provided animation services for a wide range of shows. Um, thinking of uh, series like The Last Kids on Earth, 101 Dalmatian Street, uh, there was an animated Night at the Museum sequel that came out recently, um, as well as a tie-in on Rick and Morty. Uh, so in your view, what kind of productions are the team at Atomic Cartoons most interested in working on? Oh, Mike, that's a tough one. I would say that varies drastically from artist to artist. There's some artists who are so excited about adult content, other artists super excited about feature film. There are... Um, also different style approaches that people really, really embrace or um, characters that people love, like Dalmatians was definitely one of them where some people are like, oh my gosh, I remember this and I really love the movie and translating that into series. Um, so that is a, yeah, it's a tricky one to answer fully, I would say. Even the diversity overall gets people excited because you can jump from something um, that is drastically different. Like you jump from something that leans into Rick and Morty to something that is Night at the Museum, which are very different animation styles and uh, very different stories. I think one of the things that we hear more and also things that I'm very passionate about is stories that are really highlighting um, like authenticity. Like I think we, we are very lucky to have more opportunity to be part of series like Young Love or Molly of Denali. And those really do stand out quite a bit. And, and we see it across 2D and 3D as, yeah, something really amazing. And Chelsea, Carl, I'm sure you have some thoughts around this one too, because again, this is a very personal perspective. <laughs> Yeah, I think we, there's just so much, like you were saying, there's so many different shows happening at once that you can kind of, it, it's neat to be able to jump, like, I'm going to, yeah, like work on an adult comedy right now, but you know what, no, I'm going to work on a, a preschool action show. So it's, there's, there's something for everyone on this menu, I think, which is, it's nice. It's not like we're just doing one thing over and over and over again. Uh, it's, it's always fun to work on a show where you yourself are a fan. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, uh, Oddballs is getting a few shout outs in this call, but, uh, uh, you know, having having that YouTube channel and, and being able to go through it and, and watch it evolve over the years and then be a part of that as, as it grows into something else, that's pretty fun. Um, and, you know, uh, 
everyone watching this can kind of take a look at some of the shows that Atomic has produced in the last few years. And I think you're going to see some fan favorites in there as well. So um, giving, giving a little for everyone is, I think, a big part of it. Uh, and finding that project that speaks to you really can help bring forward that passion and, uh, and make, make something more than it is. Uh, personally, uh, it's kind of funny, but some of the things I'm most proud of, I don't think anyone will ever get to watch ever. Uh, it's either a part of a development pack or some R&D that we've worked on. And, you know, it's exciting to sort of see where we can like kind of push the envelope. And it's a shame, actually, that we can't share some of that with a bigger audience because uh, some of my, some of the work that we've done that I'm most proud of, unfortunately, will will never get an audience. <laughs> It's uh, kind of a, a meme at this point where you have uh, artists talking about, oh, yeah, uh, let me talk about my past work. And they show like a gallery and it's just black squares that say NDA, NDA, NDA. <laughs> so true. <laughs> and that is always, frustrating. Um, yeah, it's very sad because, again, you want to highlight everybody's amazing work. And, and luckily at Atomic, what I do love is that at least we have opportunities to have meetings where we can show even those R&D type projects or tests or something that we have been part of or something we're trying with our teams. Unfortunately, again, it's something that we cannot stream in that same way, but um, it's, yeah, it's what I get also very passionate about. And it is a shame that it will unfortunately not always reach a larger audience out there. Carl, I wanted to start with you and ask, um, what is the workplace culture at Atomic Cartoons like? And have you learned anything about working, collaborating with artists while working at Atomic? Uh, I think we learn something every single day. Uh, yeah, there's always some new problem uh, and a new solution. So that's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, sometimes, the, like, for instance, the show that we're working on right now is a preschool show. Uh, and so when you think of preschool, you're like, oh, that's that's easy. You can, that, it's just simple shapes moving around. Uh, but the amount that you need to um, sort of boil an idea down to its most basic essence and have it very easy to understand and translate to the audience is extremely challenging. Um, and a lot of times you can sort of sell things in a way for a more adult show uh, you, you can add in some sound effects or you can push an action further to really like sell an idea and instead you need to go the opposite way and you need to like really like simplify and find just like what is the pure essence of that moment. Uh, and so watching the whole team sort of figure out some of those problems and really kind of do that collaborative work to so that each department is sort of adding to some of those story ideas and figuring out what is the the essence of that shot is uh, is pretty fun to see uh, all of those different departments coming together. Yeah, I think it's um, easy for a lot of people to underestimate the amount of work that goes into a preschool show. Uh, and I think that those productions deserve a, a lot of respect because of um, how important they can be for their viewers. Um, yeah, I, think, I think Chelsea could probably speak to that as well on a story <laughs> level. Yeah, the preschool, because I haven't really worked on a preschool show before this one. And this one is really unique because it's a comedy, which is not, you don't see much preschool comedy out there. And it's nonverbal. So we have just, there's barely any words in it. So like Carla was saying, it's, you can't rely on your old bag of tricks sometimes because preschool just doesn't understand that or a joke you can't be referential because preschoolers won't understand that. So it is like Carl was saying, boiling it down to its essence. And it's been an enormous challenge, but it's what we are getting out of it is I'm quite proud of it. <laughs> it's a really cool show. So I'm excited in whatever a year and a half or whatever it is from now that people will be able to see it. But um, yeah, it's yeah, it's definitely, I've, I've underestimated preschool and I've learned. <laughs> Uh, so Nadine, in your, from your point of view, what is the workplace culture of Atomic Cartoons like? 
it's something I hold so close to my heart, so collaborative, so open, open communication. Um, anybody is accessible at any point in time, like the way the studio really works within the whole DNA and core is that you could reach out to our leadership team um, if you just have your first day and you can't log in. I'm sure they may not be able to necessarily help you with that exact challenge, but they will guide you towards the person who can. And that is something like that open dialogue policy and the very, very transparent um, communication to me is phenomenal because it puts that creative ownership onto everybody as well. Like it is really with the focus of all of us creating together and having hopefully as much fun as possible while doing so. Again, the love for cartoons. Again, Carl, I'll call you out right there with, <laughs> with your shirt too, mm -hmm. where yes, we love cartoons and we want to do it together. And I think the focus on mentorship to me stands also out so much where everybody here and Chelsea, Carl, both of you always um, step forward with that in mind too. If there's a junior artist who just recently started or anybody who needs a little bit of support and guidance, there are so many people who will step forward and just go like, oh my gosh, yes, of course, I'd love to connect with them. I'd love to share my experiences. And that really boosts um, also the creative overall and really creates a very safe and yeah, vibrant environment to work in. So I, I love that side of it. And Chelsea, um, from your point of view, what is the workplace culture at Tom the Cartoons like? Uh, I mean, I've again sticking around for a long time because of the culture, probably partly. It's you know, it's it's all about the people that you work with. And Nadine, Carl, you've seen these two; they're great. Um, and there's just more of them at Atomic. So it's uh, yeah, it's it's wonderful to have that collaboration. And in this this um, medium is so collaborative and you have to trust people so much. And so to have those teams that you can just be like, I don't know how to solve this, Carl, fix it, you know? And then Carl's like, I got it. Um, so yeah, it's, I've learned everything from the collaboration and the, and the people at Atomic and it's, yeah, it's, it's great. <laughs> uh, I saw we have a question in the chat from Joshua Pinker. Uh, Joshua is an animation professional, and he's written a book um, about uh, careers in animation. I believe it's Your Animated Journey. And uh, he's asking, um, I think this question might be best for Nadine, uh, what's your outlook over the next year, given uh, we're coming out of a uh, huge strike? That is a very good question. It, it is something that I would say happens in our industry quite often, not necessarily based on a strike, but there is obviously a lot of ups and downs that we are seeing. And yes, we did see a slowdown in the industry overall, which is always very, very challenging um, for artists, for production folks, for technical support team members. Um, anybody who recently just also graduated, like you start your career in animation, the first thing you hear um, is, well, it's a little slower, it might take a while. Um, I can always just recommend, don't give up, those times pass, luckily. Um, they always do, they might lead to some changes, like I have definitely um, taken different paths because of those changes in our industry. But um, I'm, I'm very hopeful right now, and I might be an optimist. I definitely always would say I'm a glass half full person, but we do already see um, a lot more like projects popping up. We see a lot of stories around studios who are now um, yeah, getting more and more opportunities again because those strikes are over. But uh, I know those transitions take a little bit of time too, but it will get better for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, Atomic was uh, founded right after a period of uh, like profound challenge for the animation industries across the world, especially in TV animation. Um, so uh, artists have seen uh, much larger downturns in the past. Oh yeah, for sure. And again, it is something where looking back, even though while in it, I will not lie, that was brutal. Like I've had moments where I was like, oh, how will I be able to pay my rent the next month? Like, how do we continue on this path? And um, even though there were always a couple of moments that were quite quite hard, 
in hindsight, they always taught me so, so, so much as well. And they also taught me how many people are around me who are there to support. Like um, that is something that is actually always phenomenal during those harder times. And for example, right now from the studio side, a lot of our team members are going through portfolio reviews and giving feedback and giving guidance on cover letters just to be there for each other. It is a community-based industry. Like all of us are in it together. It is a team effort. And I think seeing that we can make it through those tougher times together is also something I, I hold very close to my heart, even though it's not it's not the fun and easy part of what we get to do for sure. Yeah. Uh, Nadine, do you have advice for artists and animators interested in, in sending portfolio to studio like Atomic Cartoons? Uh, absolutely. And reach out beforehand. Like, look us up on LinkedIn. Um, currently, I absolutely connect with quite a few people um, as well. So if there's ever any questions or anything, um, please connect. Like, we absolutely will either find also somebody who's an expert in the field that you're interested in and then can help guide like portfolios a little bit more or also really highlight even studios that are out there and currently are looking as well. But yeah, always send in an application. A lot of people ask me if when you send an application, will it just be like entered into a void and it will disappear and it's absolutely not that. Um, even if you're entering an application for general interest, we will always keep the applications. Whenever there's an opening, we'll revisit all of the applications we have. So there is no lost application ever, even if you might receive um, an immediate answer where maybe that team isn't looking for somebody. And do not take any of that personal too. I have been there many, many times and I did take it quite personal. I was like, oh, what does it mean? Is it my work that doesn't allow me to get to this place? And um, later on, I found out that it actually was never tied to the work that I was doing. And, um, and again, while you're waiting, or while you're trying to go somewhere and you feel like it could be beneficial to connect, please do so. How often would you say that Atomic Cartoons hires artists who apply with the uh, the general interest submission? Oh, gosh, that's an interesting question. I would have to follow up on the specifics. Um, I'm not sure, but I do know, um, basically, because, again, I'm not on the HR side. I actually get the luxury of uh, receiving the applications for, basically, the the openings that we have. But the way it works is basically we have the general applications. Our recruitment team will then assess where that would really fit, like what department is that person looking for? And then with that, that gets carried forward. So I would assume it's actually a higher percentage as well, just because we have so many shifts. And this is quite common in animation as well, where suddenly you might have a smaller project that pops up that suddenly needs a team and then pulling from that pool of general applications is actually incredibly helpful and also transitions within teams too. Like sometimes you suddenly need a few more people or somebody shifted to another project and then that allows us to yeah, have access for sure. But I don't know, Carl, Chelsea, would you happen to know? Because I, yeah, again, specific percentages or so I don't have available. Uh, yeah, I've uh, worked with uh, Mark, uh, on the recruiting side, um, I think they are definitely uh, creating a list. And so as positions come up, all of those uh, names are in review. Um, but for someone applying, I also don't think it's a bad idea to check in often and you know make yourself visible. I think that's always a, a good first step for any artist is to make sure that you're connecting with the people in the industry and that people know that you're available and and then that way you can also know like maybe what they're looking for and possibly even tailoring some of your skills to to match what's currently out in the industry. Also a shout out to Josh. Uh, great to hear uh, you're up there. Thanks for taking you. Um, Chelsea, I wanted to ask you, uh, do you have advice for um, storyboard artists and people in director track who are interested in sending portfolios to Atomic Cartoons? Sure, yeah, storyboards. So when I, because we receive portfolios on our show too, and since it's a comedy, I would be look strictly for comedy boards. Like I need to know if you're funny. <laughs> that's, not, that's not an easy one to teach, but 
Um, I'm a big believer in matching the artists to the show and we have so many different shows. So even if I'm looking at portfolios and I'm like, oh, this, these boards are great, but they're so action oriented. You know what? I'm going to message uh, another team that's looking for board artists that are at action. Hey, check this portfolio out, which is pretty handy where we can kind of like trade and swap um, the applications. But in terms of doing the portfolio, I would say, you know, if you want to go into action boards, if you want to go into comedy boards, tailor that portfolio to that because that if you're passionate about it, then we want you on that team because, you know, for me, I'm not a great action person. And I don't want to touch those projects as much, but comedy, give it to me. I love it. <laughs> and Carl, do you have advice for artists and animators who are or artists who are interested in um, like technical director roles or things that focus more on the pipeline? Um, yeah, so for those steps needed to move into that kind of role, um, you know, working, working your way up through the industry has definitely helped in this role. So having a pretty strong understanding of what's required for design, for build, for animation, into effects, and finally comp and final delivery. Um, having a pretty good understanding of all those departments has re really has helped me quite a bit and understanding where that balance is between departments. I think that's you know a, a common theme that we've had is that collaboration. And um, you know each department, they have their own challenges and really understanding what those challenges are within that department and what they need to be successful makes the shows more successful. So I think understanding a technical level uh, is definitely sort of a prerequisite. I would say another um, another thing that sort of supports that is also in those communication and soft soft skills as well. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of times artists will tend to suffer in silence. And it's sometimes hard to always pinpoint like where they need assistance or what they need. But sometimes it's there's some signs that show you like who needs help and who needs that one on one time. So sort of understanding also on the artist level as well of like when someone might be struggling and who to reach out to. I think some of those things can also be very helpful in some of those leadership roles. Looking to uh, the future, what do you hope to see more of from the animation industry in the next 30 years? Take it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think seeing everybody's stories and pushing creative boundaries without restrictions like I've, I'm already very inspired by how quickly you do see so many different styles and um, just yeah being able to translate what is on somebody's mind onto screen and in so many different ways is deeply inspiring and I just want to see more of it I want to hear everybody's story and and see a lot of that work out there. Um, 30 years, my gosh, yeah, that that is a long, long term to look at. I would say even within one year, I'm excited to see all of the changes and um, just amazing things that will come from it. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question to ask and I'm excited to see what will happen because again, change happens so fast. And again, it's amazing to see so many people being able to tell their stories in the way that's close to them as well and seeing them. Chelsea, what, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> it's the year 2054. What do you want the animation industry to look like? I know. It's, it's so far from now. <laughs> it's like in computers and animating with our brains. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's exciting just to see, it, like in terms of North American animation, I feel like we've just kind of scratched the surface of what this medium can actually do. and. I'm a big fan of going to film festivals and seeing all the short films and where, you know, folks from around the world are are really pushing this medium. So to would love to see that trickle into like the bigger North American sphere. We're seeing it a little bit like Spider-Verse and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are pushing that envelope and I'm loving it. They're breaking the mold. So just keep pushing it. Like this is a cool, cool medium. So I wanna see, I want everyone to know <laughs> how great it is. And Carl, uh, what do you hope to see more of uh, from the animation industry in the next thirty years? Yeah, it's a it's it's a pretty wild question to <laughs> to just ponder the what ifs. Um, you know, 
going back to what we were talking about before, uh, coming into the industry for the first time around the 2000s, there was a bit of that digital revolution. Um, I feel like we're in a similar revolution right now. It feels like there's so many new tools coming up and so many new avenues for animators to connect with an audience. It, it really does make it challenging to sort of see like, where are we even gonna be in the next three years or, or something like, like um, you know, the, the way that we're even consuming uh, television and movies is changing. Like, is, is, the, is the theater experience changing? Is, is the way that we're um, accessing any of the information changing? And so I think all those things do sort of shape the audience in a way. Um, that access to information. So, um, yeah, what is the format of television or movies moving forward? Uh, it's a, I think it's a pretty interesting time to be a filmmaker. I think there's a lot of experimentation and there's, there's a lot of ability to take some risks or some chances that might not have been, been as costly as they were before. So again, that, that barrier to entry, that, that ability to make a movie on your phone or, or um, you know, create a YouTube channel and explore new ideas without needing to sort of listen to uh, a studio's notes. And like, you can just do it for yourself and, and maybe even make a good living in that same way of just self-producing and self-publishing. So that's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, if we go so far down the rabbit hole, um, yeah, like, like Chelsea was saying, like maybe we're just beaming things straight into our brains at some point. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we got a question. I think this is a question that was on Twitch. Um, but when applying for an animation position at a studio like Atomic, how much of a uh, challenge is it if someone has 2D experience but they don't use uh, the tool that the studio primarily uses? Like, let's say it's someone who is coming from a Flash background onto a Harmony production. Is that a big hindrance, or is that something that you train on the job? Mike, that's a great question, and and thank you for sharing the questions that everybody has. Um, I would say if you have traditional animation experience and you would love to join a project that is done with um, with Harmony and, and with builds, it is actually very helpful to see something that was done with a build. I would say um, if you have a lot of Flash experience and you would like to get onto a project and you know, oh, that project is in Harmony, I'm not entirely sure if I can apply for this one, please absolutely go for it. Um, because I think the transition from somebody who's familiar with Flash to Harmony is very, very straightforward. From traditional animation towards um, puppet-based animation, there is a little bit of a learning curve, for sure. I went through it myself. It's uh, It was quite a ride <laughs> initially. But that transition happens also very quickly. So even if you have some work where you just played with a rig a little bit and um, you feel more comfortable with what you did traditionally versus what you did with a rig, I would still put maybe that um, shot in there or at least bring it up in an interview just so you can highlight like, hey, I'm working on this and I totally expand my knowledge into this realm. But um, from 2D rig-based animation um, dependent, like it's not as dependent on the software. We do have mentorship in place where we actually successfully transitioned a lot of artists um, with more flash background into Harmony and um and it can it can work out quite quickly as well is it always yeah. beneficial to get familiar with a tool before you start for sure like it's something i can always recommend but it's more from the curiosity side of things um i love learning new tools so i would always highly recommend just digging in and playing with a tool that you know is out there and is used by a studio I will add too that like uh, Toon Boom Animation offers 21 day trials for all the three tiers of Toon Boom Harmony as well as Starboard Pro. Um, so if you want to try it out, uh, it's it's out there and we have tutorials on our learn portal at learn.toonboom.com as well as uh, toonboom.com slash training where we have uh, instructor led training sessions. Um, Chelsea, I, I wanted to ask you actually like uh, drawing from that, 
Mm-hmm. It's not uncommon for storyboard artists and directors in feature to be drawing in like traditional illustration apps uh, or Photoshop. Um, do you find that the transition, like, do, do, are there um, artists who make the transition to uh, TV animation, uh, storyboarding in uh, Harmony, or not Harmony, in, in Storyboard Pro? Yeah, like, I, I had to learn Storyboard Pro too when I first started. And it, like, with any program, it can be intimidating because it's like, how do I function this? How do I find what I need to find? But um, like you were saying, there's so, it's, it's great that we live in a, a time where you can basically YouTube almost anything and be like, how, I know I want to create a new layer. How do I do that? Or what have you? But um, I think as long as you're willing to learn to the, use the, the program, like, I think once you crack that initial nut of like, opening the program, figuring out kind of the initial timeline. It's pretty it, it's pretty basic. And then once you have that, then you can build on top of that and be like, oh, I can actually do this and this, and I can create my own pens or brushes in it, or, oh, they have a presenter view. Like there, it's, there's a lot to it that even I'm like still discovering. And, um, but uh, yeah, it's not, it's intimidating at first, but it can be learned because I have done it. <laughs> so if I can, anyone can. And Carl, if someone's applying for a technical director position on a show that's Harmony, they should probably know Harmony, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, just uh, the inside scoop is we are also using those same uh, references and resources as well that you mentioned. So we are also uh, going onto the the website and finding the m- most recent release notes on the latest version of Harmony figuring out what the new modules can do. Uh, sometimes we're even just dropping them into shots and just testing them just cause, just to see like what's new out there and what's fun and exciting. Uh, and there's quite a bit. The latest Harmony releases have added uh, quite a few like weighted deformers, which we've had in the past, but they're a little bit more stable now. And, uh, and then also being able to stack deformers. So being able to use one deformer with another deformer opens up some brand new possibilities. So. I would I would say if you're looking at a technical role on a comp side or something to that effect, get creative. Uh, try try some of the new tools out there and sort of look, maybe show us a new trick or two. That that's that's always fun. So we are almost out of time. I just want to ask if you have any projects that you'd like to plug or announce, or if there's anywhere that um, viewers can find more of your work on the web. Uh, Nadine, uh, would you like to start? Absolutely. Well. Um, let me see, what can we announce? Um, I think one of our projects that was just um, released is Rocket Learns to Read, which is a special that we also did in Harmony. It's a beautiful um, preschool special, um, very painterly style, lots of textures in there, super cute. And um, so I can absolutely recommend um, heading out, watching that one. And um, I don't know how many of our current shows we can announce. Mermacorno, I believe, is one of the ones that we can highlight. It is the Tokidoki um, like connected show that we are starting on. It is um, very close to um, a lot of people's hearts. They were very excited. It was like, oh my gosh, we get to work on Mermacornos. That's amazing. Um, Chelsea, Carl, I'm actually not entirely sure how much we can share about the beautiful project you're on. We were hinting at what realm it sits. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> but. I think it can. I've asked, I, I have that hesitation all the time. I know Matt Berkowitz has said it's okay, but I still am like, ooh. Anyways, this is a Dr. Seuss project, which is exciting. So it's, yeah, Netflix is doing a few Dr. Seusses and we're one of them. So like I said, you'll probably see it eventually. <laughs> in a year. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, a couple other shows that people should check out. Uh, Molly of Denali. Uh, we've been working on that. Uh, series for a few years now, uh, and that's um, that's a really great show uh, to take a look at. And then most recently, uh, Zoki has been released through Nickelodeon, and so you can take a look online uh, for that show. That show's great. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's a, there's quite a few other shows uh, with that uh, NDA black box that we can't wait to announce. Not we're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. Hopefully, there's a few that we can share very, very soon. And anybody who hasn't seen Young Love as well, that is also a project that we were very, very excited that we were part of, and and feel very, very lucky that we were 
um, involved in, in that show. And it's incredible also there to see how you can really, really highlight things now in 2D that we never thought would be able we would be able to bring on screen um, in that way, like again, texture use and just like finding hair textures that are really, really representing um, our characters really well. It was amazing. Yeah, and, and for, for those of uh, the audience who aren't aware, uh, Young Love is uh, the continuation uh, based on Hair Love, which was the Oscar winning short um, that um, Matthew Cherry executive produced. It is uh, a beautiful short. I'm excited about the series. Um, it's really cool. Uh, all right. Um, and for anyone who wants to apply to work with Atomic Cartoons, where should they go? Uh, best uh, connection is on our website. So if you check out atomiccartoons.com, um, there is a link right there where you can submit. Um, and again, for anybody who just joined as well, if you would like to connect more directly, if you have any questions, um, just looking us up on LinkedIn. Um, I'm maybe not always checking every single day on my LinkedIn, but I usually get back within at least two days, um, just because again, it's really important for me always to, to be accessible. So if there's any questions or anything that comes even from our time here, um, we'll gladly jump in and, and help. But our website is absolutely the best place to, to send in applications. All right. Well, thank you, Nadine, Carl, and Chelsea for joining us for our very first studio tour live stream with Atomic Cartoons. We'll be inviting more studios to discuss their work on the last Thursday of each month, and you won't want to miss it. So be sure to tune in next time. Thank you so much. This was amazing. <laughs>